So I said I would go through one of the problems from short writing six. Let's take a look at number two. Uh, what we want to do is let's take this out. Uh, let's copy it out to a new file. It's just for the sake of getting stuff out of the way. I'm going to go back to that other file to, um, I'll just use this for the operators. So what do we have here? We have three sentences. Either we go, either we let a private company go to Mars or we go to Mars in the spirit of discovery and the public good. We won't go to Mars in the spirit of discovery and the public good. Looks like Mars will be owned by corporations. So one thing to note is that the same language is used in the first two sentences, but then the third sentence seems to be something entirely separate, or at least not, not the same language that's being used in the first two sentences. So that's one thing to note. So what, what do we have here? Well, we have, we'll call P, uh, we let a private company go to Mars. Then we have this other sentence. We go to Mars in the spirit of discovery and the public good. Now notice they're in one sentence, but they're two statements, right? So what connects them? Well, an operator, which operator? This, or so we have two sentences and they're clearly connected with an or. So if I want to start my, so P1 looks like this, it looks like P and then I'll take my wedge. You could just use a V, but I'm going to go ahead and use this. Um, so it's distinct from the font and I can distinguish uh, the wedge from the letter V. Uh, P2, what do we have? Well, it looks like it's just the negation of that second disjunct, right? So we won't go to, so it's just the, we go to Mars, we won't go to Mars in the spirit of discovery. So P2 is just the negation, which you can use the accent mark on your keyboard, or you can use the, uh, you can cut and paste it, copy it out from other uh, documents that I've uploaded. As you can see, it looks the same there. So, so far, this is what we have. Now we have this other sentence. Looks like Mars will be owned by corporations. Let's take out some of the attitude there and just say, Mars will be owned by uh Generations. So that's, I mean, that's clearly supposed to be the conclusion. The conclusion is C. Now, you know, you could just say, okay, this is what's being said, and then just call it. But what that leaves us with is sort of an invalid argument. I mean, the, you know, the way that this plays out in terms of the sentences involved is the premises are just totally separate sentences from what ends up in the conclusion. So what we can try and do is try to connect them somehow. Well, one thing to note right off the bat is that what we have here is an incomplete disjunctive syllogism. So if you look at P wedge D tilde D, what does that allow us to conclude? Well, that allows us to conclude P. So that's one thing to note. Now let's look at the content of P. We let a private company go to Mars. So that's what's being, you know, this is from P1, P2. So the question is, well, could we get somehow from P to C without, you know, reading too much into what's happening here? Well, what does P say? P says, we let a private company go to Mars. And what does C say? Mars will be owned by corporations. Well, it looks like what's not being stated here, and so we'll call it implicit, is another premise, namely that if P then C, and again, I'm going to take my horseshoe in this document. 
Here we've got a horseshoe, um, P, horseshoe, C. And now we can say, oh, I see. So what's being asserted here is, okay, we have this option. We can, we can let a private company go to Mars or we can do it in the spirit of discovery and the public good. We're not going to do it in the spirit of discovering the public good. So we're going to let a private company go to Mars. And what seems to be being assumed here, what's the implicit premise is that if we do that, then we'll end up with a situation where C is the case. Mars will be owned by corporations. Um, so what does this allow us to do? Well, it allows us to see what the implicit reasoning of the original arguer is, or at least get a close approximation of it. Um, so let's see here, and that would be from C1, and uh, this this is what we'll call we're calling P3. So then we get a valid argument. Now it might not be, you know, this might not be true, and this might not even be true, but at least what, what what we get in this reconstruction is a valid argument, and so we can see the reasoning process. Now, one way to think about uh, whether this is valid uh, or to think through its validity. I've already told you it's valid. It's clear that it is because you use a disjunctive syllogism and then a modus ponens, but we could also do a truth table. Now, this isn't something you had to do for the short writing uh, number six, but let's go ahead and do that so that we can have more practice doing uh, truth tables and understanding what's going on with a truth table. So let me... Stop sharing. I'll turn to the other camera here. And what we have, if you recall, is the following kind of argument. We had P wedge D tilde D, therefore P, then we had P horseshoe C, therefore C. So that's all the elements here. So we have this was P1, this was P2, this was our first conclusion. This was an implicit premise, we called it P3, and then our final conclusion was C. So let's just say, let's just start off here and say, well, you know, is this a valid argument? You know, is, is P1 to P2, this is from P1 and P2, is this a valid argument? How can I test that with a, with a truth table? Well, there we just have two sentence letters, P and D. So let's go ahead and do that truth table. And I'll show you how you test an argument for validity using a truth table. So you have your first premise, P wedge D. You have your second premise, tilde D. And then you have your conclusion, which I'm going to set off with this slash P. I know this is a little bit different than when you're just looking at one or two sentences and not trying to assess for validity, but it starts off the same way. We set it up like this. This gets us all the possible truth value combinations with two sentence letters. You have true, false, true, false, true, true, false, false. Here we have P wedge D. Now this is just going to be the definite, how we, you know, we're just playing out the definition of wedge here. So remember wedge here stands for inclusive or that means it's true when both are true or either disjunct is true and only false when both P and D are false. Tilde D, you put in the opposite values that you started off with for D. That's F, T, F, T. And then for P, you still played out T, T, F, F. You're just copying over the values. So how do you use all this information that you're, you've now uh, got to assess for validity. Remember validity is uh, the idea that if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. So what we're doing here is effectively testing for invalidity. That is, we want to see, are there any cases in which we have all true premises, but a false 
conclusion, because that would effectively give us a counterexample, an example of where we keep the form, we've got the form, but it's possible to create a situation where you have all true premises and a false conclusion. But if you look at this, there's only one row that has all true premises. So this is the value of this premise, it's the value of this premise, and then this is the value of the conclusion. But there's only one that we're interested in when we're assessing for validity, and that's the one with all true premises. There may be, multi in different arguments, there may be multiple lines with all true premises. You want to look at all of them. In this case, we just have one. And it says that the conclusion is also true. Okay, so that means what do we have? We have a valid argument. There are no lines, no rows with all true premises and a false conclusion. So we know it's not invalid, so we know it's valid. Now, if we wanted to go ahead and do the second argument as well, we could do that. Now, if you recall, the second argument is here, P horseshoe C, P is the premise, is another premise. So we have this premise, this premise. So this conclusion then works as a premise in the next argument. And then our conclusion is C. What this is, is effectively modus ponens. So again, we know it's valid, but we can play this out in terms of a truth table. So we have, again, P and C. Do our four, because... We only have the two sentence letters. We have premise one is P. Premise two is P, horseshoe C. And we have our conclusion, which is C. The order of premises doesn't matter for the validity of an argument. So there again, we have all truth value combinations. P, the first premise is just our given column for P. P horseshoe C, you recall, so that goes this way. True, true gives us true, true, false gives us false. False, true gives us true. False, false also gives us true. So look, if you don't recall this or this doesn't make sense to you, memorize it because this is the definition of horseshoe. This is what horseshoe means. It means that if you have a true antecedent and a true consequent, it outputs true. A true antecedent, a false consequent, it outputs false. And anytime you have a false antecedent, it still outputs true. It's counterintuitive, at least at first glance, but we have reasons for it. If you're interested, you can ask in the discussion and I'll talk more about why it is that we define horseshoe in this way and how it does make sense out of a good chunk of the conditionals that we use in real life. So this conditional here, it does make sense of. So there we have our premises. Our conclusion is just copying over, true, false, true, false, true, false. So again, what are we looking for? We're looking for all the rows with all true premises. Which rows have all true premises? Remember, you don't look at the givens over here. You just look at the 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 premises. So this is premise one, this is premise two, this is the truth value for the whole premise. You don't look at P or C individually in this case, you just look at the truth values for the whole conditional and that's given here. So again, we only have one row with all true premises and what do you know? It also has a true conclusion, so this is okay. Again, we have a valid argument. Why? For the exact same reasons that we have below, we've given below for the first argument, no rows with all true premises and a false conclusion. Whenever you've got an argument in, and there are no rows with all true premises and a false conclusion in a, in a truth table like this, you know that you have a valid argument.